Thank you to all our, our panelists for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here and sharing with us some of your thoughts and experiences. Uh, I think it's testimony as to how important people see this particular session, uh, given the number of people here, uh, given that we have other competing events. So I think uh, that in itself is, is, is testimony. Um, <coughs> as uh, you know, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, we'd like to have our uh, panelists uh, speak uh, to us to share with us some of their knowledges, their passion, their, their experiences. Uh, I'd like to sort of highlight the fact that uh, in the bank, we, we look at this aspect of adaptation-based mitigation as being quite critical to many of our developing country partners, communities, uh, and stakeholders. Uh, and in many, many of our countries, we get this request to not forget about the importance of adaptation and resilience building in our landscapes. Uh, and, and, and countries see and, and claim the fact that they get good carbon, they get secure carbon, they get tradable carbon because of good management in the landscape. And I think that's, that's an interesting and an important point to make from the point of view of stakeholders in, in many of our developing country, uh, uh, country, developing country partners. So I'm going to invite uh, Bianca to come and share with us uh, her vision, her passion, her knowledge and experience on, on what she's been doing and her, her, and her communities have been doing. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Bianca, please. Or you can stay there and, and talk or you come up there. Whichever, whichever. Is. Good morning. Buenos dias. Un bonjour. Pour ceux qui parlent français. Thank you, DJ. And thank you, Eric. Um, for your kind words. Um, good morning, ministers, distinguished guests. It is a privilege and a great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank Pro4 for inviting me, and uh, it gives me um, really a great pleasure to see you come here to hear us. And I know you have a lot of more important things to do that you choose to come to this forum. As you may know, I was born in Nicaragua, a land of lakes and volcanoes lying between two oceans at the center of the Americas. Nicaragua has the largest tropical rainforest north of the Amazonia, home to thousands of species of rare flora and fauna. My mother first opened my eyes to the beauty and wonders uh, of the natural world. I inherited from her my commitment to the environment, and she taught me the incalculable value of the rainforest and the importance of preserving biodiversity. For over three decades, I have campaigned for human rights, social justice, and environmental protection throughout the world. I founded the Bianca Jagger Human Rights Foundation, um, BJHRF, in 2005 to be a force for change and a voice for the most vulnerable. I would like to mention, um, even though it's not part of what I'm supposed to be telling you, my great sadness to learn today of the killing of one of the important leaders, uh, indigenous leaders in Ecuador, Jose Isidro Tendesa, of the Shuar uh, community, uh, who, who was a real opponent of the um, concessions that were given to the Chinese in Ecuador. I do make an appeal to the president to find out what happened to him, because I feel that we cannot talk about the forest if we do not care about what happened to indigenous people. Everyone in this room knows that climate change is the greatest threat we face today. 2014 will probably end up being the hottest year since records began in 1980, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We have already matched 1998's temperature, which held the dubious honor of the warmest year on record. Time is running out. Inaction will lead to severe and irreversible damage. Climate change will affect everyone, everywhere, 
and in every nation and in every echelon of society in the developing and the developed world, we will all suffer the catastrophic consequences of rising sea levels, desertification, food and water scarcity, and political unrest. But some of the most vulnerable communities in the world are bearing a disproportionate burden of the harm without having significantly contributed to the cause. This is a terrible injustice. In 2015 is the year in which we all hope for a new binding resolution in global climate negotiation. We do hope, and I know that you all hope, that something will come out of this COP20 that will lead us to that legally binding treaty in 2015. Through adaptation-based mitigation, we could tackle the catastrophe of climate change. Through one approach, we could only forestall destruction, but also actively make our communities safer, healthier, and more prosperous. Adaptation-based mitigation, where feasible, is not just, as Rachel Kite puts it, a no-regrets option. It is a no-brainer. Restoration of degraded and deforested land represent perhaps one of the best opportunities for adaptation-based mitigation in nearly every region of the world. Restoration is the bridge between mitigation and adaptation. The Global Partnership on Forest Landscape Restoration has mapped around 2 billion hectares of degraded land across the world, an area the size of South America, which offers opportunity for restoration. In 2011, leaders from around the world launched the Bond Challenge, a global goal to restore 150 million hectares of land, of degraded and deforested land by 2020. In 2012, I was appointed Bond Challenge Ambassador to IUCN. I took on this role because I believe that the objective of the Bond Challenge is critical and more importantly, it is achievable. Frankly, it is one of the most important initiatives now trying to reduce CO2 emission and improve the lives of people. According to IUCN, achieving the Bond Challenge goal could sequester up to one gigaton of carbon dioxide a year, reducing our current emissions gap by up to 17%. That is really a very important um, uh, advance and up an apport from uh, the restoration program. In many places where members of the global partnership work, restoration of the graded land has been predicted to sequester carbon more costly effective than many competing mitigation options. If sequestering carbon were the only benefit of welcoming trees and shrubs back to the graded land, some would think that that was enough, but it isn't. Um, but we know there are many more reasons for restoration. There are dozens of examples in places like China and Brazil where massive-scale restoration has been accomplished, not just to thwart climate change, but to deal with natural disasters that our communities are now facing at an increasing pace and severity every day. China has restored millions of hectares of the forested land in order to stabilize water flows in its arid regions and reduce some storms and floods. In 2012, while participating at the UN Conference on Sustainability at Rio Plus 20, I visited the Tingua Bocaina Diversity Corridor, TBBC initiative outside of Rio de Janeiro created and run by the Institute Terra de Preservación Ambiental, ITPA. The story is inspiring, a sterling example of this kind of restoration initiative. Large areas of Atlantic forests outside Rio were devastated by centuries of exploitation and deforestation. The area contains the Guandu River, which provides 80% of the water uh, to metropolitan Rio and 30% of the city energy supply. The deforestation comprised water quality, energy output for seven to 10 million people in Rio. 
the area has a high proportion of endemic species and these species were unable to migrate from one area to another. Over the course of six years, the ETPA has restored and reforested over 190,000 hectares uh, of land, creating a biodiversity corridor which preserves the quality and quantity of water resources for Rio de Janeiro, balances the microclimate, helps biodiversity, and curbs soil erosion. This initiative has also generated many new jobs, making this effort one of the largest employers in the upstream watershed area of Rio de Janeiro. During my visit, I planted a sampling king tree. Um, I hope to come back and see it in years to come when it will be part of a forest hillside. This spring, we will be uh, see the launch of the second phase of the Bonn Challenge, Bonn 2.0 in Germany. I expect that we will be able to announce new and significant commitments at that event, not only commitments of hectares to the global goal, but perhaps more importantly, to partnership for implementation. Already more than 51 million hectares of land have been committed to the Bonn Challenge from the following countries, the United States, Rwanda, El Salvador, Costa Rica, the Brazilian Mata Atlantica, Restoration Pact, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Niger, Colombia, Ethiopia, and Guatemala. In fact, we announced that in New York, that we have pledges for 51 million hectares of land already as part of the Restoration and the Bonn Challenge um, initiative to restore 150 million hectares of land by 2020. Some of these commitments, like those made by the United States, have already resulted in restoration activities. In the US, these activities have created thousands of new jobs, um, millions of dollars in restoration income, and hundreds of thousands of hectares of new habitat for wildlife. They have also created significant hectares of carbon sinks and made vulnerable communities more resilient to climate change, particularly through the better management of forest land. In, at the September Climate uh, Summit in New York, the City of New York Declaration on Forest supplemented the Bonn Challenge Global Ambition to aim to restore an additional 200 million hectares of land by 2030. That declaration was signed by over 100 national and subnational governments, corporations, indigenous peoples, organizations, and civil society. As you can see, not everything is lost. It is true that governments have not come forward to do what is necessary. It is true that we don't have a legally binding treaty now. But if we continue with initiatives like the Bond Challenge, we will see a difference. Forests are essential to our future. More than 1.6 billion people depend on them for food, water, fuel, medicine, traditional cultures, and livelihood. Forests support up to 80% of biodiversity on Earth and play a vital role in safeguards, the safeguarding the climate by naturally sequestering carbon. Landscape restoration is an adaptation-based mitigation measure which has proven track record and a growing, a, growing, a growing global movement. We know the goal and the means. Now we just need to do it. Let's push land restoration to the top of the political agenda. This is a, this is a unique opportunity to renew our forest landscapes, our fate and the fate of future generations depend on it, and I count on you to be able to support this initiative and to do what is necessary to make it a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca. That was an inspiring uh, talk. Uh, thank you for your time and your, and your vision. Mark Hero, uh, Yes, you, as you wish, sir, uh, if you like to say.
Am I on? Yes. yes. May I have my presentation materials, please? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great pleasure for me that this morning I'm standing in front of you to address this issue of uh, moving forward with adaptation-based mitigation. When I go into this issue, why am I jumping too fast? Is it a delay? Yes. The red. Where? Yeah, I want. Yeah, there yeah, is. Yeah. I was looking into the definition of mitigation and adaptation that is made by UNFCCC. And this is what, uh, if we need to recall ourselves in terms of what is this, the adaptation is meant by. Uh, UNFCCC to refers to adjustment in ecological, social, or economic systems. So it's basically systems that needs to be adjusted in response to actual or expected climate, climatic uh, stimuli and their effects or impacts. On the other hand, mitigation is defined as any anthropogenic intervention that can either reduce the sources of greenhouse gas emission or enhancement of their sinks. One is in terms of uh, interventions, the other is adjustment of the systems. So when you're talking about adaptation-based mitigations, you're talking about interventions that recognize the need for adjustment of the systems. Right? I, that's my understanding of that. So it was a very great pleasure for me to start and offer to you the start from the real beginning. People say that the climate change is so much uh, dominated, the discussion on climate change is so much dominated by the issue of energy, fossil fuel for the very, very core. But when you're talking about that, it's actually getting from the planet what is inside, moving out and burn it, and that is the issue. But when you're talking about land base, landscape, then you're talking about more upper level. You're talking about the surface. You're talking about the landscape. And when you're talking about the landscape, what will be the icon that we can say that the landscape is actually also very active in terms of produce, producing climate change? Let's see this picture, if I can move this uh, quickly. In the year 1997, ladies and gentlemen, a big mega fire happened in Indonesia. This fire and the haze was so strong that it broke the ozone. It is taken from a high-level satellite and it is claimed, uh, scientists said, that the emission that happened on this occasion of 1997 had emitted three gigatons in one year low. How can we say that actually landscape is not or less important than energy in terms of creating and actually needs to be addressed when you're talking about climate change? Indonesia is in a country that is both highly vulnerable to climate change because we have long coastline, large agricultural dependent populations, and an important contributor to climate change through emissions from its Lulu CF. Achieving both mitigation and adaptation at the same time is a prerogative for us, and I am glad to participate at this event which recognized this. So that is 1997. What happened before 1997? I don't know if that's related or not. Indonesia declared that for the sake of food security, we need to open one million hectares of peatland to change that into paddy fields, to change that into providing food for the country, providing food for the world. So you see there that the security, the food security drive the policy to open up the peatland in 1996. With El Nino coming in 97, climate change gets into its peak. 
See, the relationship, this is serious. This is serious relationship. 1.4 million hectares of peatland was opened for the sake of food security. Now, is that all that is happening? Does it stop there? Does the Indonesian people and the world get to the senses and stop that? Not so easy. This is what happened when I flew over the area nearby that uh, uh, the uh, one million hectares uh, of peatland that was open. It's not only plantations that is coming up, but also and mostly mining. So with this mining company, small and big, are searching for minerals and making use of chemicals and you see how the land is so pockmarked because of that. Very bad. I don't know if that happens in anywhere in the world, but I believe that it may actually happen in different places of the world. Now, after that mining, we also say, look, we have opened the, the pit land. Now let's put plantations on that. So you, this is the picture whereby you see the plantations open on top of the pit land that is still forested on the other side. And what happened is that there are built a lot of canals to clear the water so that people can plant on top of it. Disaster. That, ladies and gentlemen, is part of what causes the 1997 uh, mega fire in Indonesia. Yesterday, I mentioned that when you're talking about climate change and you're talking about the sustainability of the planet, you need to know and you need to accept that the planet is sick. This is the planet that is sick. And we want to move that into something that is healthier. So when we are talking about trying to make it more healthy, then what you need to actually do is to start thinking how to combine. If you are talking only about mitigation, then you are talking only about one half that interdependently actually drag down the adaptation. Let's see this picture. This is what's happening on the ground, day by day. That people clear their peatland for plantations, make the canal, and on the other side, you still see the forest that is standing, and every day you have the temptation, let's cross the canal. So, are we talking about mitigating the move, mitigate the move, or adapt for the results? We need to adapt for the results. If the result happens, how do we adapt to that? Okay, so that is the combination that I was really very concerned about when looking into this situation. Too often we see adaptations and mitigations discussed separately. Even in the Green Climate Fund, for instance, which there is still so much left to discuss, the single clarification that has been made is the division of funds for climate change mitigations and adaptation activities. For many countries, this makes sense. Those at the most risk for rising sea level contribute negligible amount to climate change. But for large countries like with complex ecosystems like Indonesia, like Brazil, like India, and like China, it does not make sense. Mitigation and adaptation for a country like Indonesia is a prerogative. It's not something that you can do one after another. Adaptation-based mitigation aligns well with Indonesia's vision of beyond carbon more than just forest. It allows for the contextualizing, the contextualizing of development within a broader paradigm shift toward sustainability. Indonesia's trident, uh, this is act actually a picture where Indonesia and Brazil is working together on the ground uh, for issue of this issue, say, the same issue. And 2011, as you can see. There you go. Ah, there you go. I will say that the, the, the Indonesia's Trident Key Performance Indicators, this is what we are trying to achieve through RED+. Plus. Not just climate change mitigation, not just climate change adaptation, but a whole new approach to human environment relationship. If you look into that, one of the, the axes is sustainable development with equity. The other axis we are talking about 
reduce emissions and increase carbon stock. And the third axis, conserve and maintain biodiversity and ecosystem services. When we are talking about conserve and maintain biodiversity and ecosystem services, ladies and gentlemen, we are very cognizant that we have not done justice to the rights of the people who actually guard the land. And we have changed that, and our constitutional court last year has made a statement that the land of the masyarakat adat, the, the indigenous people, is actually the land of them and not of the state. So a lot of practices that was based on the thinking that the land of the indigenous people was actually the land of the state will need to be changed. That is a big sustainability uh, agenda that we are pushing there. Now, if we use this, how do we apply that in the locations on the ground? That is our dashboard for a plus moving forward, whereby that national target and what is happening in the province, what is happening in the district will be uh, monitored and controlled by the, the Red Plus agency. Even with that kind of extensive effort, ladies and gentlemen, there is no guarantee that Red Plus will achieve adaptation-based mitigations. Interpreting Red Plus as an incentive to create mono plantations or of carbon sequestering trees will not contribute to adaptation, nor will it likely create the sustainable growth with equity. Rather, it might destabilize environmental resilience, put at risk local livelihoods and resource dependence. We must keep these trade-offs in mind in order to create a version of Red Plus that delivers upon its potential for win-win solution for people and planet. An important question is financing adaptation-based mitigation in the context of Red Plus. We need to continue to talk about non-carbon benefit. We need to continue to talk about it, difficult as it is. If we are only rewarded for carbon sequestration and reduced emission, this is just mitigation. And a very narrow approach to mitigation at that. We need support for sustainable landscape management as a whole. And I think that the options that are emerging, the Atelia funds, the biocarbon fund, as well as our own Freddy Plus construct, looks like we recognize that. Agriculture, ladies and gentlemen, is a crucial element and test for adaptation-based mitigation. It is an area characterized by perhaps the starkest trade-offs between environmental, economic, and human well-being. I think that illustration of the looking for food security and looking into the peatland and say we can do it without the necessary follow-up, the necessary costly preparation is actually a disaster in waiting. It's a, the trade-off between eco environmental, economic, and human well-being. We must find ways of doing agriculture sustainably at scale. I hope that you can do that one million new, uh, hectares of agriculture, new land at scale, for instance, with a paludic on peatlands. I think that will be one of the solutions that we need to be, to have. We need the right institution to support adaptation-based mitigation. This is by no means simple. Governing sustainable landscape is a very demanding in terms of technical and human capacity. Given the number of elements at play and their interrelationship, and their interrelationship. In Indonesia, I think we are moving in the right directions with the right concept of forest management unit. Yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned that Red Plus is actually a hybrid of the agenda of climate change and development because it is happening in the developing country. Red Plus is a hybrid of an agenda that is a hybrid of climate change as well as development and making use of the landscape and forest as a living theater. The living theater continuously alive. And because of that, mitigation as well, mitigation or adaptation-based mitigation uh, initiative is a prerogative because one is not addressing the living nature of the forest and the landscape itself. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Park Hero, for that uh, very insightful regional uh, presentation with uh, clearly global uh, outreach. Um, I, would you like to come? I could either stay or come to the podium as you wish. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm, I'm on? Yes. Okay. Good morning. I will uh, present you, if you allow me, a program that I am leading from the African Union and NEPAD side that is called Terra Africa, and uh, which is uh, actually a global partnership on uh, sustainable, sustainable land and water management. And you will see that uh, by default this program, this partnership is doing uh, adaptation and mitigation combined together. Um, by, by itself, even without um, mentioning it or stating it uh, formally. So T Terra Africa was a project that was uh, born uh, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, following some lesson learned from previous um, uh, uh, support program support to Africa. And uh, the idea was basically to scale up the land and water management and um, in, uh, in, in developing, uh, in contributing to the development of uh, Africa. So Terra Africa was born to, um, in 2005, and now we are entering the third uh, cycle, the third, um, uh, yes, the extension for the third cycle. The first one was uh, focused mainly on agriculture production and land. And then after the first cycle, it was um, agreed to move to more sustainable land and water, manag uh, water management. And uh, there was a, a, a big program that was uh, agreed upon called SAWAP, Sahel and um, West Africa program. And you may have heard about the Great Green Wall uh, initiative, which, is, uh, which consists in uh, regreening the whole um, Sahel um, uh, strip from Senegal to, to Djibouti, but not only doing restoration and conservation, but also um, having a strong agro, agro forest, forestry uh, initiative, especially targeting uh, local communities, uh, uh, farmers. And this program can be easily labeled as a adaptation uh, based uh, mitigation, adaptation based mitigation uh, program. And, um, now we are entering the, the third phase, which will start uh, this coming year, for five uh, giving a um, beginning of answer to this uh, question. If we have development in mind, rather than trying to have uh, this silo adaptation, mitigation, it, it becomes clear that when you do adaptation, you can find mitigation aspect there. It's that we are not we don't, uh, project developers or maybe government when they are planning for adaptation activities, don't, for instance, um, systematically measure the, the carbon component of, a, of an adaptation uh, project. And I think this is the, this mind shift that we, 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 should, we should have. Uh, for instance, in my country, in Senegal, we are, there is a lot of uh, mangrove. Uh, uh, plant, uh, planting and restoration along the, the, the coastal, southern coastal, uh, coastal zone in Casamance. And we only look at the, at the moment the, the adaptation part that uh, it, it helps to fix the, 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 the coastal uh, soils and, um, and give a, a livelihood to, 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 to some communities there. But the, the next step to make it mitigation, uh, mitigation oriented is to measure the, 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 the carbon that was captured in, the, in this uh, adaptation, uh, uh, primarily adaptation labeled activity. And we, we, we have to, to um, explain or to assist our countries, developing countries. Mr. Minister from Indonesia mentioned China, India, that this separation doesn't, doesn't make sense, but also for uh, African countries and developing countries in general. That when you make, when you do an adaptation project, have a specialist or an expert on carbon uh, measurement to come and, uh, and, and do, the, do, do that, that work. And you can have your adaptation um, benefits that, 
that goes directly to, to, the, to the population, to your population, but you can also enter the, the, the carbon market by, uh, by um, if you go through this rigorous uh, um, uh, process of CDM or uh, all, the, all the market mechanisms, you can even get access to, 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 to CERs or... Uh, so I, I don't think that, um, especially for countries which need, we have to say it's uh, straight, who, who, who need development first, this separation can be seen as artificial. Uh, really, and that's why we, we when we when we work with countries in preparing their investment framework on sustainable land and water management, we uh, we, we we advise them not to look only to to windows uh, financing windows that target only land uh, restoration or land degradation, but also to to prepare their project in a in a in a way that uh, the carbon component will be taken into, into account. It might require extra expertise or extra, um, extra work, but I think it is, uh, it is worth of, uh, of it. And in Terra Africa, in addition to supporting countries to prepare an investment framework on sustainable, and land, um, sustainable land and water management, we are now developing with um, World Bank, which is uh, one of the main partners of this uh, of this um, initiative, we are developing a training uh, that, that will go online very soon to, to, to have a very simple way of uh, calculating uh, the carbon content of each of uh, acti activities or projects we are, we are undertaking. And I have colleagues uh, here in the, um, in the room who are uh, specialists on that side of our work who can easily, with whom you can easily liaise and they will tell you about the next coming um, uh, online or face-to-face -face training where you can calculate your uh, carbon, uh, the carbon content of your project and then also uh, um, tap into the mitigation uh, part of uh, existing, existing funding. So, and um, this, is, um, this is what I wanted to say that this, this uh, for negotiation purposes, it could be could be uh, much more easier. But when we do development projects, we have to, 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 to take into account adaptation and, uh, and mitigation, uh, mitigation in the same in the in the same pack in the same package. And uh, this way, we can access the new uh, upcoming funding like the Gre the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund, which is now operational the LDC fund and the special climate change of, um, of, um, uh, of the, the, the UNFCCC uh, processes. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you very much, um, thank you. Thank you for reminding us that, you know, adaptation mitigation, if done right, uh, essentially two sides of the same coin. Uh, and so that, that's an important. And that's a perfect segue to Mark, who's going to talk about, uh, about finance and uh, much of the finance uh, talk, as you will hear, is how do we get this to scale? A, we need lots of money, and, uh, and B, how do we get these very <coughs> valuable local participatory uh, uh, initiatives scaled up in the sense that you know, they mean something to our financial uh, markets, and where do we access this capital? Thank you, Mark. Well, th thanks, thanks very much. I'd just, like to, um, I'd just like to tell you a story listening to everybody who is far more knowledgeable than myself being a financier. I'd just like to tell you a story about the forests, and I think this is important. All the forests that you've seen in, in, in all the, the videos have shown these dark green, <coughs> temperate uh, rainforests. Now, the map that you saw of Indonesia and, and the fires showed a little bit of northern Australia. And there are schemes that are taking place that deal with adaptation and mitigation. And I don't say this just because I happen to work in my third retirement for Credit Suisse, but there is a project in northern Australia that encapsulates everything that all of my fellow panelists have been talking about. And it's a thing called the Fish River Development which actually deals with adaptation and mitigation 
um, of 10 million hectares of not forest in the way that you typically have been looking at it, but in in low rainfall savanna and high rainfall savanna in the Kimberleys, and uh, which is just north of Arnhem Land, and, and, and then in Cape York, which is in Queensland. And this is 10 million hectares where there are 16 uh, indigenous tribes. And this land has been degraded by beef farming for generations. And of course, if you go back um, before white settlement, the indigenous peoples took great care of their land and every year burnt off in the winter certain parts of this savanna. Now, what happened with, um, with unregulated um, farming practices that took place a hundred years ago was that there was enormous build-up of feedstock so that in the middle of summer there was enormous fire not unlike the sorts of fires that you've seen in 1997 and of course this was this was catastrophic in terms of the regeneration of the plants regeneration of the grasses the, the biodiversity but not only that the land management so into this has come um, three elements. One, uh, a recognition that this is bad management. Um, but what has happened is that a mining company, the largest mining company in the world, BHP Billiton, has decided that this is the major project that they're going to finance in Australia. And they are working with a, another well-renowned group, the Nature Conservancy Group, and I have to say that Credit Suisse has made a modest contribution, but this is to scale up sustainable land management practices by indigenous communities across more than 10 million hectares of land in the Kimberley, Cape York and Arnhem land. And this is by the control of wildfires, um, firing the land at the right time and actually trying to revert back to the practices of a thousand or so years ago. It's actually incredibly simple when you think about it, but it's incredibly effective. Now, it's, it's a fantastic story because it also is a self-financing story because the amount of carbon that is captured by these enhanced management techniques can actually be sold for carbon credits that self-perpetuates this process of land management. And that's a really good story. Um, and I think it's, 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 you know, we talk about land use and forest. This is 10 million hectares of savanna wetland, which is a forest in my, in my, and of course the aim is to take that <coughs> example down into the Kimberleys, where of course you've got the low rainfall savanna, which you still have the same problems with catastrophic fires. So that's a really good story about, about, about what you can do and the very essence of what we're talking about here. We, but, but what is the problem in that? The problem in that is it's actually financed by philanthropy because carbon credits on their own will not actually finance this particular development. So what I'd like to say just in some opening remarks, which I hope don't go on much longer for you, but is that having been involved in, in this whole agenda through, um, through my own interests and, and my relationship as a special advisor to UNEP and, and having seen as a member of the, of, of, the, of the G20 for Australia for some time all these issues um, being evolved, I'd say two things to you. The first thing is that in the finance sector, as Paul Paulson said, in a speech early today, the tipping point has been reached. And there's no question that for the sorts of commitments that you need from the finance sector around the world, the money is there. The question is, how, how, how do you actually get it? And we spoke earlier in the session when we were talking before we came here about this is an innate frustration because the money is there the awareness is there. I think the other point that came out of this morning is that with social media, 
the sort of pressures that will come upon financiers and corporations and the business community from all the stakeholders, that, that the consumers, the investors, the retirees, will actually drive people to attenuate all of the things you talk about here into the way they do business. But the key thing for me is that you're going to have all this terrific driving focus to, to, to try and get the financial um, community, which controls tens of trillions of dollars, to actually start to finance uh, the environment in a better way and a more sustainable way and, and the sort of issues we're talking about. But the question is, how do you deal with the fact that, that mitigation and adaptation is at the small scale. It's 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 not even SME. It's it's it. We're talking about and we're we're talking about microfinancing. So how do you get the trillions of dollars, or the forty billion dollars that are raised by green bonds this year, which will go to hundred billion dollars? How do you get that through to the small people who are doing the right thing with respect to how they're adapting and mitigating in their farming techniques and what they're doing in Indonesia and Africa? Uh, and that is the big question, I think, uh, that needs to be solved by uh, people far cleverer than, 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 than I am. Because if you look at what's happened in, in small businesses, it's been the, the investment banks, to be perfectly frank, that have led the securitization of large amounts of money to be able to enable intermediaries to finance others. Because large amounts of money are available but they're not available in the form of, of, of small loans to people. So if, if you understand what I'm saying, what I'm saying here is there's these trillions of dollars, there's this $40 billion of, of green bonds, but they are all going into identifiable large-scale infrastructure projects um, that obviously are, 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 are deal with mitigation. But the next key is how do you get that money down um, in some form of package that is identifiable um, and registrable um, that is the, I think that's the big challenge, if I could say, of, 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 of the people over the next four or five years, is to get the money down to the people that make the difference. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, an exciting range of uh, presentations, comments, uh, insights. Uh, the way I'd like to sort of carry on the next uh, I think we have about uh, half an hour because we started late, so um, let's try and use that uh, as efficiently as possible so that the audience here can ask you uh, some questions. I have some questions here, but let's go to the audience because I'm sure they're anxious <coughs> to, to be able to communicate and then we can come back uh, later. Please identify yourself, uh, where, which agency or, or country you come from, and then keep your question brief, please, so that you know, we can get as many as, uh, as possible. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, need a mic here. Thank you. Morning. Uh, Jill Blockus from the Nature Conservancy. I'm curious if uh, any of the panelists have had an experience with impact investing, and given the, the last speaker's comments, uh, maybe that is one way forward in terms of accessing additional finance. I, I agree, green bonds are very, very important. Um, but thank you for all your range of presentations. I have plenty of other questions, but I'll stick with that one. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the impact investing question. Have you had any experience with it? Yes, let's take a few and then we'll, we'll come back. And um, if you're addressing your question to anybody in particular, please identify to it. Uh, this is a question to the panel, Stephen Leonard from C4. Um, in the current climate negotiations, uh, there's been mitigation, adaptation synergies emerge in the context of Red Plus and some discussion in the Green Climate Fund as well as the ADP. But the issue hasn't uh, managed to get much traction despite the realities that are occurring on the ground. And I'd be interested to know from the panel what you think would be uh, useful in terms of international policy development to create the incentives to move uh, mitigation and adapt or a more integrated and synergistic approach forward. Thanks. Uh, yeah, could you, could you repeat that because I think uh, just the last bit, it was difficult to catch. Okay, sorry. Um, just slowly. Yeah. In terms of the uh, international policy development, what do you think would be um, 
useful to create more incentives to move forward with a more integrated approach to mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. Incentives for integrated approach to mitigation and adaptation. Uh, anybody else? Okay, let's 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 start, and then we'll, as people warm up, we'll come back. Uh, anybody wants to take the the first one about impact investing? Uh, any experiences that you might have had? Uh, I'm afraid I haven't um, I have any direct experience of, of, of impact investing, but I'd just like to say one thing which is generic to your, to your point, and that is that, that, that um, the frustration with m mitigation is that it's quite hard to, 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 for, for a financier to, to contemplate how you finance mitigation. Um, you can change behaviour if you look at the insurance industry. Um, you know, 20 years ago, they went through a horrific period of not understanding climate change and not understanding what was happening, and they nearly disappeared. Uh, and since then, they've dealt with the future. And if you look at what um, what Governor Carney said at the Bank of England um, about two months ago, whereby he asked all the insurance companies what their plans were with respect to the managing of their investments in a 30 to 40 year time horizon, you attenuated sort of focus on, 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 on that. Um, um, impact investing, it's, it's quite hard to see. You know, that, that's very hard to finance. I mean, I'm talking about lending. I'm not talking about actual investment per se. Anybody else? Have you on that? Maybe I can try to say yeah. something about that. You see, the picture that I showed in terms of the one million hectares peatland that was converted to plantation for food is actually a case in point in my mind. Study has been done on that 1.4 million hectares, actually it's 1.4 million hectares. And the problem with the peat is that there has been a lot of canals that make the peat dry and it tends to burn when it is there. You know, that peat is actually a young coal. So when you burn on the top, the fire gets inside. And even if you then have rain, the fire is still inside your heart. So when the, get, the air gets dry, the fire comes up again. It's a never ending fire. So you need to manage that because that is a source of emission that is so bad. But on the other hand, we need the food security. So there are part of that one million that can actually be converted into agriculture for food. The question now is that how can we use the concept of adaptation-based mitigations to generate the financing that will make the canal blocking happen and also the study and also the strategy that make that 1.4 million hectares not only sequestering more carbon, not only getting the enhancement of carbon stock, but at the same time produce food security. That's the first place it was intended. Now, some people will say that carbon is high risk because the market is not there and all those things. But the peatland is there, the land is there, and the, substan the sus sustainability of the development on that land is there. With the right ethic, with the right safeguards, with including, including the forest dwelling people in the equations. And actually, we have a case a business case for financing that is not that risky and because of that adaptation based mitigation is perhaps the first argument to make financing happen in this kind of a sustainable development with equity concept. There are many cases like uh, the case of the peatland of Indonesia in the world. I think we need to package it that way. I think what has been done by Artelia in Peru with SEMA uh, Cordelia Azul is one part of the possibility that we can do. But that is just a small one. We need to be a bigger one. Mm -hmm. And I think the drive moving into that is theirs. But if that Green Climate Fund okay, is actually so much di defect, uh, 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 defeat into adaptations and mitigations, then perhaps we are not getting closer to the holistic solution. Yeah, thank can you. I, I think uh, just before you go ahead, Mark. Can, can, I, can I just like I should like come back on one point on impact investing in, in, in an optimistic note. 
is that if you, I just want to go back to the point I made about green bonds. Green bonds at the moment are financing infrastructure that are really, you know, unbelievably important. But I think that we should be aspirational. And uh, I was bold enough to say at another forum that, that, that in terms of impact investing, that we ought to think in four or five years' time of a green bond that finances a specific uh, whole ecosystem. And the obvious, uh, being Australian for me, is a $1 billion green bond uh, for the Barrier Reef. That's the sort of thing that we need to move to, whereby um, investing is a generic term, but I'm talking about a bond um, that actually helps the development of that, and obviously it has certain. So I think that I am optimistic. It's just a question of scale and how you... Yes, I think there was a study not too long ago done by the Rockefeller Foundation that actually went to some of the fund managers and sort of said, okay, on the one hand, you know, as was highlighted, we have billions of dollars of demand or, or, or offer of funding. So ODA has been about 150 billion uh, over a long period and it's unlikely to increase anytime mm -hmm. soon. Uh, uh, you might be talking of a 100 billion plus of carbon yeah. uh, funding available in the near future. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got at least a trillion dollars in demand for uh, sustainable food systems. If you look at water supply and sanitation globally, it's in probably another two trillion. And if you want to really get into the infrastructure, you you're to, talking yeah. of the three trillion. So in, in essence, you're talking several trillion dollars on the one hand and a fairly small offer in terms of financing on the other. And I think this is what has created this very interesting space in, uh, for, of how do you access this tremendous amount of capital that's lying in the insurance industry in, 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 you know, in, in these uh, capital markets. I think the point has been made is there is clearly a playing space for agencies. You know, what the funds managers uh, apparently reported in their survey that A, they weren't finding adequate projects of sufficient scale. B, they were sort of lacking uh, technical assistance, technical know-how sources. And C, they were looking for guarantees or guarantors. Uh, the kinds of guarantees that MIGA provides, for example, from the World Bank for various programs. Uh, and so clearly there, is, there are potential uh, opportunities to be had here if we are able to bring the right parties together and sort of put in place uh, opportunities. Um, we had one more question, uh, which was the, uh, the uh, policy uh, instruments, right, how to, to look at uh, uh, integrated uh, uh, adaptation mitigation. Anybody wants to take a look at that, uh, take a crack at it? No, I, I will come back to this question on how to create more incentive for uh, mitigation investment. I will reverse the proposal that um, just based on uh, the latest uh, figures we have that out of the uh, climate uh, funds, the whole climate funds or investment, uh, we calculated that 70% are dedicated to mit mitigation already even if they are low compared to the tri trillions that are available out, out there. This is one, another point. So 70% for mitigation, 30% for uh, adaptation. So now the proposal, if you reverse it, is how to uh, show in adaptation uh, um, projects, activities, that there are mitigation potential to, to also bring some of the investment in, uh, in adaptation because we know that most of the adaptation money is from ODA and we know that it is, it is decreasing since more than a decade, decade. So now how to bring investor, private sector, to be interested in adaptation activities and I think this is, and link it to development of course, and this is a huge, huge challenge that as a community we will be facing in the, in the coming, coming years that uh, maybe because mitigation is more of an interest of donors, investors that are in developed countries. That, but we have to bring this interest in adaptation. And one of our challenges in the new Terra Africa cycle will be to, to do analytical work, to do advocacy work, to show to, to investors, private investors, that the investment framework of countries in Africa are worth to, 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 to get investment in. So, so this is, this is the, the next challenge on how to uh, create more investment, more incentive 
for investment in adaptation. Thank you very much, Mamadou. Oh, you know, an interesting anecdote here, it's actually a fact. Costa Rica, I manage the Costa Rica from the, from the bank uh, side, the Costa Rica's forest carbon partnership uh, efforts. And they are the, currently the first country to sign a letter of intent to supply emissions reductions equivalent to about $63 million. This is from the carbon fund. The, the principal uh, objective or goal of that six, uh, distribution of that $63 million will be to, ha to enhance their world famous payment for environmental services program that Costa Rica has already put in place. That's being financed by a 3% tax on the gasoline tax or 3% cut from the gasoline tax that uh, Costa Rica gets. So it's a very interesting approach whereby you take money, revenue from fossil fuels, you channel it into payments for ecosystem services, environment systems, or environmental services, good behavior, modify behavioral change, and then you supplement it with additional funds that are coming from essentially a mitigation uh, program. I think this is, this is a fascinating, it's one model, it's uh, relatively small in the bigger picture of things, but I think it holds out hope uh, and, op uh, and an optimistic way to look at it. Um, I wanted to go quickly to Bianca uh, to talk a little bit. You mentioned the bond uh, it was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, would you like to comment some more about how uh, this is panning out at the national level, for example, sure. some examples? That would be great. For example, the Bond Challenge is helping to crystallize opportunities in countries and giving recognition to existing domestic uh, mm. goals. For example, in Guatemala, yeah. it has increased momentum for restoration, including for the development of restoration initiative system for small landowners and communities, as well as for large landowners. Mm -hmm. In the Mata Atlantica, which I spoke mm -hmm. before, um, Restoration Pact in Brazil, the Bon Challenge has given global recognition and added impetus to an existing multi-stakeholder restoration initiative. So you've seen yeah. this all over the world, where they have already uh, initiated the Bon mm -hmm. Challenge. In Ethiopia, for example, the construction to the Bond Challenge is reinforcing restoration programs aimed at improving food and water <coughs> security and attracting more international interest in this program. The really important things about restoration is that this is not simply about planting trees. Mm -hmm. the, the greatest thing about the restoration initiative is that includes the communities and the communities have a say as to how they want it to be implemented. And for example, in El Salvador and Rwanda um, and elsewhere, it has contributed to the Bond Challenge is unlocking finance for implementation, mm. which you wouldn't get maybe any other, way, any other way. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is bringing useful focus to the country's red strategy and helping to unlock uh, related funding. And the exact impetus for an impact of contributing to the Bond Challenge differ in each context. So the Bond Challenge um, initiative of restoration is very different in different countries, okay. even within Latin America, or within Asia, or within Africa, or in the United States. But it is really an extraordinary initiative mm. that can really uh, be uh, a tool to combat climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have some more questions. Uh, can we, yes, please. Thank you. Please identify yourself. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for this interesting mix of you know views that we've heard. Um, I'd actually like to pick upon a little bit. I actually wanted to make a comment which Eric very eloquently put. I was saying that as a model, uh, the PES system it could be one way to say how the money trickles down, all these billions which are there, trickles down to the community. So, and that's some, a model to be tested and seen, particularly given that when you look at the PES, there are two ends, the users and the providers. So how do you sort of link them? But I think I'll change my question a little bit to uh, talk about the business engagement in this landscape approach when you're talking about adaptation-based mitigation. I think during this course of yesterday, we heard a lot about um, you know, the public and public-private policy and the financing. So perhaps if the panels have any views on 
on the how to make this business lucrative for the investors. You know, so what is it that we are trying to do? Do you think creating an enabling environment is probably the way to go to, for, for the investors to be interested in actually going to the grassroots and investing that money? So any views on that would be very much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. How do you create the enabling environment? And I think you were getting to that in some of your comments, Mark. <laughs> 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 anyway. Anybody else? No? Yeah, yes, please. Um. Marcus Gehring from the CISDL, the Center for International Sustainable Development Law. I had a question about uh, adaptation-based mitigation because we're struggling to uh, accommodate uh, fundamental rights and human rights of the affected communities in these schemes. Wouldn't uh, adaptation-based mitigation make it even more complicated and add another layer mm -hmm. to the complex issues? Um, yeah. That's a very interesting question. He says, uh, wouldn't adaptation-based mitigation make it more complex in terms of, if I understood you correctly, Mario, in terms of uh, the rights of people to access resources, their lands, etc.? Well, I think that we have seen not only here the adaptation in, in the discussion that we are having, but in all the negotiations of the Red Plus, um, where it's been so difficult to include um, in the safeguards respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and for their culture, and in particularly one of the, the big obstacles has been because it, the, the necessity to recognize the, the, the right to their ancestral land. And uh, so it, it is very complex, and the big question that we have is will indigenous peoples, local communities, and the people who are not the big players be able to have access to these um, fundings. And I, I feel and I fear that we still have not really uh, established the mechanism for them to have that access. And, uh, and you know, you, we, we are here in Peru. We saw that there were four indigenous peoples who were recently killed. Uh, we now learn today about the killing of a leader in Ecuador, and if you look at the whole of Latin America and many other countries, we see the struggle of indigenous people, and not just to, to access finances, but simply to survive. Did anybody else want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Would it make it more complex? To yeah, it's getting more complex, of course. Mm -hmm. When you add all these elements, it's like what uh, we discussed yesterday, that what is being paid? It being paid is the gigaton of carbon. And how you include all these elements that is talking about adaptation thing into that market offering. Okay, so within one gigaton of carbon, there is ins instilled into that the value of sustainability, the value of the rights of the indigenous people, the value of the ecosystem services, the value of that. So if you're talking about PES as one model, yes, but it is very, very rudimentary model because you need to add the other element as well. So that's coming from the two ends. Okay, The first one end is the carbon end and the other one is the PES end. You need to combine and suddenly you see, oops, I still have a big hollow. And what is that big hollow? That big hollow is the biodiversity, the big hollow is the right of the uh, forest dwelling people, the big hollow is this and that. So my thinking in terms of regulations or, uh, or uh, directions toward that is even if that is imperfect, let's start with that. Based in the base of that is something that is not in the terms of uh, the, the financial market is not depreciating. Now, 
that is getting more complexity again because you need to create and establish the value of your natural asset. Your landscape value is not depreciating if you take care of that and put the right value on that. So basically, it's a safe investment, but what is the market offering? You start with carbon because it's already established, but then you need you put in the value of the PES, you put in the value of the recognitions and protections of the rights of the indigenous people, you eat the, add the value of that, and suddenly you said the market offering, the unit that is being traded is perhaps five times the unit of carbon in the original form. So basically, you create that concept, and the government may need to put the directions toward that. But waiting for the government to finalize that at the national level may be too difficult and too long. So I will encourage that projects can be put that and start getting finance in a way that even if that's imperfect, that will be the first step toward a perfect system in the future. And again, because adaptations is about changing systems, this is one of the systems that needs to be changed. Could, could yes, I just, please. Yeah, go ahead. I'll say an answer to, to Bianca, the, the, the point that made the, the example I gave of, of Fish River and the 10 million hectares. Um, there were uh, nine indigenous, separate indigenous tribes, Aboriginal tribes involved, and one of the priorities of that, or the priority, was the empowerment of those peoples. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at the photos um, pre the Fish River Project and post the Fish River Project, you see people who are now proud, fully employed, in charge of their own environment, and, and, and obviously that took money from, 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 from a major mining company. It also honestly took the government to actually acquire some very large cattle lands to give them back. I'm not denying any of that, but, but, but the equality of opportunity and recognition of the rights of the indigenous people was a priority as well as restoration and adaptation and carbon. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, there was another question about enabling environments for investors, and then we'll come back. Yeah, go ahead. Does anybody want to take take that? Yes, on on um, payments for ecosystem services. Of course, it's the having the legal and even more justice environment that makes that if a certain area is exploited, just natural resources used the the benefit come back to the to the to the recipient or to the people living there this is the, the first uh, first pride and we talk about uh, indigenous rights and uh, but this is valid in general in for all the natural resources that if a country has uh, oil and then um, should make sure that the, the the benefits come back to the to the population it's the same the same approach now we, here we talk about environmental uh, benefits now about comp to me complexity is not the issue uh, the the climate change itself even the the, the biophysical as aspect is uh, complex already this is a complexity is not uh, an, uh, an issue and when we look at the evolution of the the, the climate change uh, process so in the eight, uh, late uh, 80s when the negotiation, negotiation started, we, we are not talk, talking about mit, uh, mitigation, adaptation. Now we have this separation. And we move, for instance, to give another example. For uh, 10 years, we get used to Luluseh, land use, land use change, and forestry. And now we, in Bali, we had the red uh, that was uh, bring in, and we put them in a parallel. So in the climate change process, you have negotiation on Luluseh and, and red, another complexity. Now we move to CSA, Climate Smart Agriculture, and we are having the landscape to new, relatively new uh, concept that goes, uh, and we, we spend, or the community spends spend years to understand the, the, the semantic already, and this delays implementation, especially for countries that need development activities right now. So complexity is not an issue. The issue be, uh, comes when you get a country, especially developing countries, who go and uh, to look for support for uh, 
mitigation and is told that this is adaptation, you cannot access this funding because it's only for adapt mitigation. This is more of, a, of an issue than the, the, com the complexity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, unfortunately, we uh, uh, take one more question because we have a gentleman um, there who's been... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Robert Chimambo, Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance. I don't know what the, my young brother says there, that there's no complexity, because I see complexity right across uh, this whole thing. But just uh, um, to listening to the plenary, you know, especially from the Liver CEO, Liver Brothers, um, and uh, my brother from Indonesia, the, the issue of separation, adaptation, mitigation, it starts from the, the convention itself that historical responsibilities and the rest mm -hmm. of them. So this is where we're coming from. That uh, those that are responsible for, you know, causing climate change must be responsible for the rest of it. So we can't run away from that. But I think what I, it, it is good that uh, this concept has to be explained. You are saying Indonesia is big, China is big. And that's where the suspicion arises that we see China, Indonesia, you linking up with the, the polluters leaving all of us uh, floating away, small countries. So there's a suspicion. I know what is happening in the negotiations right now. There's uh, the, in, 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 uh, the, the other issue of uh, individually determined com uh, contributions. And the people are wanting to run away with mitigation. And the countries like mine are saying, no, but it must be a package. So I think it, it, it is a complex problem. Let's accept it. And, uh, there's suspicions, but there's suspicion about this thing. But just for my friend on the financial sector, the way we understand this thing is that it is climate change. I mean, it's happening already in the Philippines. People are dying. That's the big picture. That's the environment in which we are. Climate change is happening. How I heard the CEO from Liver Brothers saying, how do we get the financial sector to put a human face in the financing, instead of looking at it from a mere quarterly and the political end of five-year terms, that climate change is going to be with us for a long time and people are going to die. How do we use the resources? These are human resources, financial resources, to help, to mitigate, to save lives. I think that's the context that financial people like you should put this. I think if it's put in that context, not just to make money, but to help save the, the globe, generation to come, it will help. And you will find a lot of support from if you put it in that context. Because I, what I get here, especially coming from a justice uh, angle, is that uh, people just want to, to make money. But people are dying. I don't know how the financial sector would do that. I mean, this, what we got from uh, the CEO, Lever Brothers, was very good. But that's a start. The philosophy is changing that it's not just about making money, but about saving lives, generations of youths, and so on. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody wants to take that? Can I, can I just say one thing? Um, I, I said this at a forum about a month ago. Um, a report that was done by, by McKinsey's and Chris Weiss and WWF said that there needed to be 200 to $300 billion a year, a year, um, invested in sustainable development to deal with the issue you talk about, right? So that's the amount of money. That's a lot of money. So, and you make the very good point that, that, that at the end of the day, um, governments and philanthropists can only do a tiny portion of that. So you then have to ramp up the amount of money. I'm not talking about carrots. I'm talking about direct investment. So we're talking about direct government investment, direct phil philanthropic investment in, in, in sustainable development and all the issues we talk about here today. So to actually get the sort of money, you have to ramp that up by 25 to 30 times. That means you need the private sector. That means you need the people that I represent, but, but not that I represent, it's the private represent bank, but you need the, the people that have the global investable funds. Now, to, to do that, um, you know, they are unfortunately businesses, they all want a return, but people want a variety of returns. There are some people who are prepared to have social bonds that will have negligible returns. There are people that are prepared to invest because they've got some form of carrot. 
and carrot comes in all sorts of colours. Carrot comes in a tax deduction. Carrot comes in a, in a mandated investment. Carrots comes in the way that actually frees up investors to look at sort of climate type investments. So all, but but I, I just like to say that that I am optimistic. It might be an age thing with me, but I'm optimistic, <laughs> and I think that you are what was said in 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 in, in the in the um, conversation earlier. You are at a tipping point where social media is going to drive an accelerated form <coughs> of 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 um, attenuation in terms of investment and support through the financial sector. But I think the other thing is that, that, that you know, sustainable development is economic growth, is profitable development. It's not, it's not one or the other. Um, so I'm optimistic the money will come. It's very frustrating for people that want it. Um, but I, I speak on behalf of the, of the large scale investors. I'm not, I'm an investment banker, but, 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 but you know, the private sector needs to be critically involved uh, in going forward, and, and I'm optimistic. Okay. I'd like to say something with regard to sustainable development. Sustainable development is a contradiction in itself. I don't know that there is such a thing as sustainable development. But if there was, we could only have sustainable development if it, it encompasses the principles Mm. of respect for human rights and good yeah. governance. And unfortunately, mm. as somebody who was born in Nicaragua and who has a human rights organization that works on social justice and environmental issues, I could tell you that the, the, the race um, to develop um, many of our developing countries have left behind a trail of so much destruction and harm to the environment and harm to people that if we really want to um, go forward, we need to change our understanding and our concept of what development should do. And we need to think very carefully that we are at the tipping point and that we are facing catastrophic climate change and that we need to protect our communities, our indigenous peoples, and that if development is going to go ahead, it cannot go ahead any longer the way it has gone until today. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, I you. think we'll close, yeah. Uh, thank you very much to all our distinguished panelists. This was very, very interesting, very insightful, I think. Uh, and thank you to all for your patience and your contributions to this session.